this is Selma Schimmel at ASCO 2011, where we continue our discussion with physicians addressing a variety of cancer types and breaking news and new data. And now we're going to talk about ovarian cancer with one of our nation's leading authorities, Dr. Beth Carlin. Dr. Carlin is the director of the Women's Cancer Program at the Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. She is also professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Hello, Dr. Carlin. Good to see you, Selma. Thank you for making time because you are a very, very busy doctor here. We're all very busy and we're all really inspired by the data presented here and by our patients. What distinguishes you is not only are you a clinician, but you are a researcher. Yes. And I really do want to talk about some of your research. We're going to talk about two areas of one screening, but in particular the PARP inhibitor. And I know that Cedar sinai is one of the institutions that has been involved in the PARP studies. That's correct, and there have been some very interesting data presented, on, presented here with regards to the PARP inhibitor called ol Olaparib. Um, last year, Dr. Audi presented data looking at Olaparib in the setting of recurrent ovarian cancer in women who had a B germline, had inherited a BRCA mutation, and demonstrated a very exciting approximately 33% response rate. That was an objective response rate based on CT or resist criteria, so really showing that the tumors seem to shrink with the Olaparib. Where is the trial now? What phase trial? So the trial that was presented here today that was very exciting is actually a trial looking at this PARP inhibitor in the maintenance setting for recurrent ovarian cancer. So eligible patients had had recurrent ovarian cancer, had had at least two prior platinum-based chemotherapies, now demonstrated again response to a platinum, but were at a place where they would go on a maintenance treatment. They were randomized, it was a phase two randomized trial using this oral PARP inhibitor, um, and patients either got the standard of care, which was placebo, as they were now in a maintenance phase, or the PARP inhibitor. So what the trial showed was that those women who were taking the active agent actually remained in remission for about four months longer compared to those on placebo. In fact, the hazard ratio for a benefit showed almost two-thirds of the patients had a significant benefit. When you look at the impact, because I've heard doctors describe the PARP inhibitor as a miraculous, mm -hmm. I mean, big words, mm -hmm. I don't know what your impression is, but I think those are pretty profound words, a miraculous breakthrough in the treatment of, mm -hmm. for this subgroup of patients. Do you see it ever? or soon moving it into an earlier, yeah. maybe even first-line therapy? It's not a panacea, okay? I don't think PARP inhibitors are going to be a cure for all women with ovarian or breast cancer or, or any of those, but it is a significant step forward in terms of improving survivorship and uh, time in remission and time to be able to enjoy um, when, you know, a progression-free survival is what we call life, right, is, is living in remission. So I think PARP inhibitors really provide a significant quantum time for us to do that. The great interest and the great excitement I have with regards to PARP is that it opens up another mechanism for us to kill cancer cells in a, with a targeted approach that may have less toxicity. So it, PARPs allow us to look at a mechanism that's called synthetic lethality. And it's basically playing on the cancer cell's own deficiencies that make it a cancer cell and giving it sort of um, a double negative, a way for it to cause its own self to explode. What we understand from the Cancer Genome Atlas Project and other studies now is that BRCA-like deficiencies occur in almost half of all women with papillary serous ovarian cancers, which is the majority of ovarian cancers. So we actually have an opportunity with PARP inhibitors to play on that 
DNA damage repair deficiency that causes cells to be cancer cells and allow the and cause these tumors to auto destruct. And so the net cast with the potential usefulness of PARP inhibitors is not just the 10 or 13 percent of women who have a mutation that they've inherited that may be part of the etiology of their ovarian cancer, but really spread out to maybe half of the women who have high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Why is it a particular uh, effectiveness for the BRCA-positive patient? One of the roles of the BRCA gene in all of our cells, the normal BRCA gene, is to help DNA repair some of the typos along the way. Our cells reproduce every day, and with the base pairs and the, in re, the reproduction of the DNA, there's occasional typos. And our evolutionary biology has given us four or six ways to make sure those typos don't move forward and cells don't become malignant. When one has a deficiency in BRCA, one of the most important ways to repair DNA damage called homologous recombination deficiency, a, a big word, but it's a way to repair double-stranded DNA breaks, goes awry. Now, in a cell that has, is just missing part of that process, there's all these other pathways. Nucleotide excision repair, base excision repair. I mean, evolution's been very good to us as a human species that allow us to have this redundancy so that if you inherit a BRCA mutation, you have all these other things along the way. What PARP does, it takes out one of those additional processes. So sort of the belt and suspenders. Mm -hmm. If BRCA is your belt, you have your suspenders as PARP. But if you have a PARP inhibitor and you, you lose your belt and suspenders, you drop your pants and the cell dies. So it's this idea that you're setting up this way that causes the cells to die. On one hand, based on its own defect, and on the other hand, this other one that PARP alone in a cell that is functional BRCA doesn't bother the normal cells. And that's what we talk about, this targeted approach. It's it's leading to cell death or apoptosis is only in those cells that are already missing one pathway of DNA damage repair. You put the second one on it mm -hmm. and it falls away. And I think what's coming out that's so exciting is that we're now realizing that maybe half of all high-grade serous tumors have some BR BRCA defect. So BRCA, of course, can be inherited as a mutation and these BRCA genes, but there's also other ways to cause deficiency in BRCA function. The cancer cell itself could have a mutation that occurs just in the cancer. The, the function of the BRCA could be inhibited because the signal to say to make the protein that has to do with its promoter, the, the switch that says turn on or off, mm -hmm. there are ways that we can have through what we call epigenetics, things that occur through life that basically keep the BRCA switch in the off position. So even though the gene itself is normal, it does, the cell doesn't know to make it. And when you add up all of these things, inherited BRCA mutations, acquired BRCA mutations, switch problems, mm -hmm. it encompasses about half of the ovarian cancers. And indeed, what was so exciting in the trial presented here at ASCO, it was open to all women who achieved a remission and were platinum sensitive, not just BRCA. In fact, two thirds of the women on the trial did not have a BRCA mutation. And they too had an equal benefit from the PARP inhibitor. How far are we away from advancing the use of PARPs in an earlier stage of treatment? We are currently looking at PARPs in combination with chemotherapy currently still in a recurrent setting because it's very important to determine the combined toxicities mm -hmm. and the sequencing of the two. While it is an oral agent, the day-to-day -day toxicities are predominantly nausea and fatigue that tend to be manageable, but we do see additive effects when given with chemotherapy in terms of anemia. Um, 
Some patients, rarely, but there's been a number of cases of myelodysplastic syndrome, of pre-leukemia, and actually leukemia associated with PARP use. So we clearly want to extend quality of life and survival and survivorship for women and men with cancer, but we also want to be very careful about what some of those secondary effects may be. One of the secondary effects that I want to ask you about was the suggestion from one physician mentioning the possibility of premature aging mm -hmm. associated with the PARP. Is that indeed uh, a concern? It's difficult to measure. Um, the, there are many PARP inhibitor-like drugs in being developed at the current time. And they are not identical. They're not just isomers of one another. One of the PARP agents that had some data presented here actually binds the telomeres. And the telomeres are those portion that shorten with age. And so there may be some impact. So because there are a number of PARP agents, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that all of the PARP inhibitors are appropriate for a particular cancer type, is that correct? We don't know yet because um, each one acts slightly differently. And um, in ovary cancer, there's three or four PARP agents being looked at in clinical trials. Some have more positive findings than others. And with any of the targeted agents, we're still trying to figure out the best way to use them best time to use them and the best the patients who will benefit from them the most. All right, so next year at this time we're going to come back and hopefully revisit with new data coming out of your research. Yes. Thank you Dr. Beth Carlin, Director of the Women's Cancer Program at the Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute at Cedar sinai Medical Center in our hometown of Los Angeles, California, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Selma. Thanks, Dr. Carlin.